Good evening, everyone. My name is Chris Williams, and I'm the assistant director of the James Farmer Multicultural Center. And tonight we will be ha having our next event for our Native American cultural celebration. We are fortunate to have uh, two very special individuals with us tonight. But before I pass it along to uh, Scott Harris of the James Monroe Museum, I want to acknowledge the partnership that we've had over the past three years in our programming, especially during our Native American cultural celebration. So we've been grateful to have that collaboration between the James Monroe Museum and the James Farmer Multicultural Center. And now I will pass it along to uh, one of our student leaders uh, for our, within our James Farmer Multicultural Center, uh, Sarah. Hi, everybody. My name is Sarah. I am the vice president of the Native American Student Association. I am part of the Chippewa tribe out of Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan. Very excited to be here. <laughs> well, Sarah and uh, Chris, thank you very much. Um, uh, you know, we're all part of the University of Mary Washington, and we all come with different perspectives to how we uh, work within our, our uh, organizations, missions, and the institutional mission overall of the university. And um, uh, I echo what Chris said about the uh, a really great feeling we have about the collaboration with the James Farmer Multicultural Center on a variety of things, including uh, this. Um, we hope it's something that Dr. Farmer, who was on our faculty for a number of years, uh, would be proud of that we, we have those collaborations going on. Um, as this is a program, uh, that involves the James Monroe Museum, uh, one of our university museums. We want to acknowledge uh, the supporters that make the online programming that we do uh, possible. Uh, we're fortunate to have support from the Fredericksburg Savings Charitable Foundation, from the Paul and Jane Jones Trust, administered by our friend Walter Sheffield, uh, the Stuart Jones Trust, and the Friends of the James Monroe Museum. Uh, and we invite folks who are interested to go to the website or Facebook pages uh, for the James Monroe Museum uh, in order to find out more. Um, this program uh, and many others that the museums at UMW are doing are available on our YouTube and Facebook pages. So we encourage you uh, to just do some Google searching. You'll find them very quickly that way. Um, because this is a program involving a James Monroe Museum, uh, we do note that um, as President of the United States, the fifth president from 1817 to 1825, James Monroe followed policies on Indian relations that, uh, in his view, probably in the view of a lot of his contemporaries, were rational, uh, humane by the standards of that time. But from our perspective, uh, there's a, a, a cultural arrogance, a paternalism there, uh, and an insensitivity that, that cannot be ignored. Monroe was an advocate of the surrender of Native people's sovereignty um, for the uh, care by the, the federal government to be assimilated into white culture. Uh, and that was his approach to try and manage the pressures of westward expansion against uh, the lands of the people uh, in the West. Um, it was not a formula that was likely to succeed. And as we know, it did not. Uh, and it would continue a pattern that would go on down through a lot of American history. So we, we have to be real in examining the ramifications of that. And we hope that by taking part in programming in which we can look at other aspects of uh, Native American culture, of African American culture, uh, we can try and bring some balance to the interpretation that the museum does. So we appreciate your chance to be a part of this. Um, we do point out to folks that this is a recording. Uh, obviously, you will not have an opportunity for live interaction on this one, um, but we do invite questions. If you want to send them to the uh, James Renault Museum's uh, Facebook page, the email link there, we'd be glad to try and follow those up later uh, if you hear something you'd like to know more about. In the traditional telling of American Indian history, from the perspective of, his, of historians who were predominantly white and male, uh, women were often stereotyped in the roles of wife and mother, uh, tender of crops, preparer of food, and women did perform those vital tasks. But their status and their influence within Indian cultures uh, were rarely received a, a really thorough interpretation for a very long time. In fact, the two such women who were arguably the most famous um, from American Indian culture were celebrated for their roles in serving uh, the needs of white explorers 
Pocahontas, the purported savior of uh, John Smith and Sacagawea, who guided the Lewis and Clark expedition. American Indian women have been treated in more depth, though, in recent scholarship by academic historians, and especially in work since the late 1960s by the group of uh, indigenous writers who collectively known as the Native American Renaissance. But women in this culture are not simply figures of the past. They are also increasingly assuming leadership roles individually and collectively in their contemporary tribal communities. And we are fortunate this evening to hold a conversation with two such women. Ann Richardson is chief of the Rappahannock tribe. She is the first woman to be elected as a chief in Virginia since the 1600s. Born to Chief and Mrs. Captain Nelson of Indian Neck, Virginia, she is a fourth generation chief in her family. Her academic background is in business and her employment history has been in business management and in nonprofit administration. Ms. Richardson was elected assistant chief uh, uh, to her father in 1980. She served as assistant for 18 years before achieving uh, the, the uh, role of chief in 1998. In 1980, she helped organize a study and work closely with state politicians and historians to establish that the current Virginia tribes could be traced to their historical predecessors for the state recognition initiative. In 1983, legislation was passed granting state recognition to the Virginia tribes based on documented evidence compiled in the study validating that the current eight tribes descend from the historic tribes. In 1989, she helped organize the United Indians of Virginia, which was established as an intertribal organization represented by all the tribal chiefs. In 1995, Chief Richardson began an aggressive campaign to revitalize her community culturally, socially, and economically. The campaign included the development of a three-phase, 11,000 square foot Rappahannock cultural complex and an array of programs and projects to revitalize her rural community. Future plans for the tribe are to develop a museum, a Native American retreat and holistic healing center, along with organic farming. And uh, those are just some of the projects that are culturally appropriate for her people. Chief Richardson ran for the Republican nomination for the Virginia House of Delegates in 2001, and was appointed to the State Advisory Council for the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights. Chief Richardson's work to secure federal acknowledgement of Rappahannock sovereignty uh, came in 19 excuse me, in 2018 via congressional action. We're also fortunate to have with us Glenna J. Wallace, chief of the uh, Eastern Shawnee tribe of Oklahoma. Chief Wallace was born in Ottawa County, Oklahoma, and has lived within 15 miles of her birthplace her entire life, with the exception of three years during her youth when she and her family were migrant workers on the West Coast. These formative years impacted her greatly, teaching her to set goals, develop a work ethic, accept accountability, be optimistic, and treat each person with dignity. For 38 and a half years, she served as instructor, department chair, uh, division chair, director of travel, and interim academic dean at Crowder College in Neosho, Missouri, where she estimates she taught about 25,000 students. A dedicated community servant, she has served on countless committees and boards and has been honored with numerous awards. In 2006, Ms. Wallace was elected chief of the Eastern Shawnee Tribe, an honor she continues to hold. During this time, thanks to dedicated business committee members and committed employees, the tribe has seen the addition of nine duplexes for elders, completion of 11 new tribal buildings or additions, two casinos, road construction, a host of grants funded, new programs initiating, uh, initiated, including a Shawnee language program, and land holdings growing from approximately 400 acres to more than 2,500 acres. Progress has also been evident in the homelands of Ohio, where federally recognized tribes are now consulted on a regular basis with Chief Wallace participating in seeking a World Heritage nomination for the Newark Mounds in Ohio. Also obtaining a cemetery there for burial of human remains and modernization of Ohio burial laws. We are clearly privileged to have two women who have been so active, so involved with their communities um, on our air this evening. So Chief Richardson, Chief Wallace, welcome. Thank you. Now, what we will do here is uh, I've got several questions that we'll do some alternating um, 
Uh, I believe by the coin toss at the beginning, just like in the uh, Super Bowl, Chief Richardson won the toss. We'll throw the first question to her and then ask uh, Chief Wallace to answer, and then we'll kind of alternate that. We'll see how well we can do that. Um, and uh, I want to start, um, maybe expand a little bit on what was in the biography. Chief Richardson, how would you describe the, the, the process by which you became chief and, and generally what your duties are? Uh, you are muted, Chief Richardson. Sorry, can you hear me now? Yes. So historically, our tribe was, um, uh, the leadership was a hereditary in the family, um, stemming back from the Powhatan Confederacy. And um, everyone that has taken that position in 1921, our tribe, reorganized and formally incorporated with the state of Virginia because of all of the racism here. Uh, we established um, a legal entity by which we could hire attorneys and lobbyists to fight for us. And at that time, we had to move to an elected process, which uh, was not tradition traditional to our people. So um, they moved to an election process, but um, as a result of that, everyone who would have hereditarily have taken the job was elected. So it was just really an adaptation of this new system um, that the people utilized, but they kept their own traditions going. So I'm a fourth generation chief in my family. Um, and I worked and lived and eat and breathed. Indian politics and Indian issues my entire life and uh, worked with my dad alongside my dad when I became a teenager um, to write letters, to type letters for him and to help him um, facilitate meetings and things like that. So I've always been in it as far as I can remember in one way or another. Um, and in our community, a person who rises to leadership rises through consistent um, leadership, consistent work, and consistent work ethic in their community, of serving the community. And that's how you rise to leadership in our community. Chief Wallace, um, you also were elected to your role. Uh, uh, can you characterize how that fit into the, the role of chiefs in, in uh, the Shawnee culture? My background would be quite different from that that Chief uh, Ann has uh, described. Um, in 1830, as hopefully most people know, the Indian Removal Act was passed. We were a woodland tribe and we were located in the Ohio Valley, not necessarily the state of Ohio, but the Ohio Valley, which incorporated about five current states. Um, we were, uh, along with the Senecas, referred to as the mixed band, and we're living on a reservation there in Ohio. Uh, the, the two of us, the mixed band, we were the first ones in the entire United States to be forcibly removed uh, after that Indian Removal Act was passed. And so our forefathers walked on foot or rode horseback 800 miles to leave the area that we had known <laughs> and were brought to Indian Territory. In Indian Territory, um, there basically were no other Indians. Uh, assimilation has been the story of my tribe. And uh, consequently, although I always knew that I was an Indian and always knew that I was Shawnee, uh, we did not participate in anything that had to do with, uh, the, there simply weren't any Indian activities. Uh, we, our forefathers had to work to, to live. Uh, they had to change uh, the processes entirely. And uh, we did not become a tribe that had a constitution until um, 1938. So in 1938, um, uh, because we were so assimilated, uh, we had an election. And uh, so we have known who our chiefs were since 1938, but prior to that time, we did not know. Um, I became chief, uh, we have elections, uh, they are four year terms. And so there isn't a limit on uh, how long you can serve as long as you are reelected by the people. 
Um, my tribe is approximately 3,750 people. Uh, fewer than one third of those live in this area. Uh, the economy of Oklahoma, it didn't become a state until 1907. And again, remember we came here in uh, 1832. So in that time, Oklahoma has never been known as a prosperous state. And particularly in the Dust Bowl days, uh, people left here and many, many went to the West Coast uh, to find jobs, to find employment, to be able to survive. And so uh, my family stayed here in this area. Uh, like Ann says, years and years ago, I think it was hereditary, but that is not the situation today. It is a political uh, race and uh, we have tribal members who live in all 50 states. So um, as I say, one third here, two thirds are scattered every place. So ours are election, uh, absentee elections. And uh, I was first elected in 2006, the first female uh, that we know of uh, to have ever been elected as chief of the uh, Eastern Shawnee tribe. As I said, we were known as the mixed band back in 1832 when the civil war occurred. And then after the Civil War, there were several Indian tribes that had been relocated to Kansas. Those tribes were moved down into Indian territory, which was still Indian territory. And uh, so we have nine federally recognized tribes in one little county here in Oklahoma with seven of those coming from the Ohio Valley and were removed uh, in our case only one time, but with the other tribes removed more than once. So I have been reelected since 2006. Um, I've been here for 15 years. Um, again, never participated in, we didn't have powwows, we didn't have ceremonials, we were totally assimilated. So it was through education and becoming involved in the tribe, particularly in gaming, that led to my decision to run for chief. I should note too, um, uh, for viewers, uh, just for clarity, perhaps that the um, uh, uh, Chief Wallace's tribe uh, and in the area she describes in Oklahoma is right on the border with Missouri. Um, and so I guess it would be fair to say Eastern Oklahoma. Uh, Northeast Oklahoma. Uh, right. And then for the Rappahannock tribe outside of the Fredericksburg region, Northern neck of Virginia, uh, that area, the, the Northern part of the Tidewater or coastal area of Virginia would roughly conform uh, for people who want to look at a map and, and see where the peoples are that we're talking about. Um, it, it sounds as though um, in both cases, your groups, as you say, had to adapt from ways that were traditions that went back, you know, literally generations, perhaps thousands of years, certainly many hundreds, uh, to a, a system in some ways that, that represented more of a, um, uh, a democratic form of government or something that might be uh, more likened to what a, a state uh, or a, municipal a municipality, in your case, sovereign entities uh, would undertake. So you, you are uh, in, in large part administrators of your communities. Is that a fair way of saying it? Absolutely. <laughs> and so you find all of the responsibilities of, of providing essential services, of, of, of running the the, uh, the body politic of your communities, um, uh, as, as well as the, uh, the cultural and, and uh, the um, uh, historical traditions that you try to maintain. So what, what's it like to sort of have all of those functions uh, within this overlay of obviously being within American uh, culture uh, as well? Uh, Chief, Chief Ann, let's go with you. Okay, so it keeps me really busy as you might think. Um, so I really uh, manage the day-to-day um, -day government operations of the organization um, and develop the various departments that uh, we are providing services for the community through. Uh, a big part of that now is uh, our cultural uh, preservation. And so we have um, historical researchers in that department, we have an archaeology team. Um, we have uh, cultural classes for the young people, and uh, we do a number of uh, historical events throughout the year. 
Um, and, and we have a number of exhibits throughout the year at our cultural center. Uh, so all of it keeps me busy. The research is ongoing. And so that piece of um, the work, I have very competent scholars over those areas and I work very closely with them. Uh, we also have environmental services. We work very closely with that. As we're working to bring um, my grandmother's, uh, who was my great grandfather was a, a, a medicine man, he was a healer. And she recorded his recipes in the early 20s. Um, and so we're working to bring those plants back. Some of them are extinct in our area. So we're working to bring those back and to open a center where uh, a holistic doctor will come in and teach people how to heal themselves with natural preparations. Um, Chief Wallace, you, you've you got, uh, again, I assume a lot of those same functions and, and very actively within that community on the Oklahoma-Missouri border that y'all are within, right? Like Chief Richardson, I am extremely busy and I am in charge of the day-to-day -day, uh, aspects. Unfortunately, we are not nearly the traditional tribe that she talks about. Uh, again, remember, uh, I'm assuming that her tribe stayed within the same area where they have always been, and that's not our case at all. In fact, even when we were in the Ohio Valley, we can document that we, we lived in 26 different states. So to try to find mm -hmm. our history and to try to find our culture and so forth, that's just something that we have not been able to do. Uh, one of the things that I've been proud of doing is that we didn't even know our history here in Oklahoma. We wouldn't be able to tell you who our chiefs were from 1832, mm -hmm. how long each one was uh, in that position, how they attained that position. That's one of the things that we have done is we've gone back and researched since 1832. We have published our own history books, so we do know all of those chiefs and, and their terms. Um, again, um, I became interested in this tribe in a very roundabout way because um, in the year 2000, uh, certainly I'm an adult, certainly I've been teaching for several years at a community college and I have, uh, again, as you point out, I'm in a four state corner that uh, within 20 minutes of where I am, I can be in either Kansas or Oklahoma or Arkansas or Missouri, and my people are, are, are spread that way also in four different states. We have complications in that we are co-owners of a, an Indian clinic, and yet Indian clinics are supervised. We fall under the uh, IHS, the Indian Health Service, and the Indian Health Service indicates that our region is 14 counties in Oklahoma. That doesn't do justice to us at all, with having people 15 minutes from here who live in an entirely different state, but mm. they technically are not eligible for the services that were guaranteed to us in treaties. And so we're in a more complicated situation uh, with that. But it was in the year 2000 that I was in my office at Crowder College and in came the uh, CEO of the Missouri Humanities Organization. And uh, he indicated that the Lewis and Clark uh, Bicentennial was going to be occurring in 2003 and that he wanted every single tribe that was mentioned that had been in Missouri, that had been mentioned in the Lewis and Clark journals, he wanted them represented and highly represented in the Lewis and Clark uh, Bicentennial. And it happens that the first tribe that was mentioned in the Lewis and Clark journals was the Shawnee tribe. And it happens that even though my tribe is in Missouri, I am three minutes from my tribal headquarters, but I live in, in Missouri, not in Oklahoma. Uh, and so um, he learned that I was Shawnee and that I was in Missouri. So he came and asked me to participate in um, a three year travel experience uh, talking about my tribe. And, and I said, I can't do that, I'm sorry. Uh, I apologize, but no. I can't accept that invitation. And he, he couldn't understand why. He said, I've talked with your president. Your president says you're active. Your, your president says you can talk. You're not intimidated by crowds. And I said, all of that is true, but I don't know the history of my tribe. And in fact, nobody knows the history of my tribe. 
that's on my bucket list. When I retire, I'm going to research my tribe. And he looked at me and he looked at the walls of my office and said, I see several degrees listed up there. I see several honors listed up there. You've had to have done research. You've had to have written papers. This is 2000 and you don't have to do this until 2003. So you have three years, research your tribe. Just move it forward on your bucket list. And that's, that's what happened. So for three years, I researched Shawnees. That meant researching the state of Ohio a great deal. And then in 2003, every summer and oftentimes on weekends through the rest of the year, I traveled extensively and gave Chautauqua presentations on the Shawnees in the Lewis and Clark time period. And being that active for six years doing the history and the presentation of my tribe, that led me to realize I probably knew historically more about our tribe than most people did. And that's what motivated me to run for chief in 2006 and to be elected. So it had nothing to do with experience that I had culturally or anything else, but rather an academic historical. And it's been a goal of mine to try to bring in more cultural aspects, which we were doing quite well until COVID certainly put, gave us a setback for the last two years involving that. Yes. Mm -hmm. I do want to touch on that experience for both of your, your tribes, uh, the, the COVID experience uh, in a moment. But, but I, I do wonder, and Chief Wallace, I'll just stay with you on this one uh, to start. One thing that y'all do share, even though your backgrounds of your, your peoples and your, your sort of modern evolution are, are, have taken somewhat different paths, you were both federally recognized tribes. Is that correct? That's correct. Absolutely. Right. So Chief Wallace, can you talk a bit about what that means? What does that mean in reality? Um, um, not necessarily, you know, cite the legislation unless you want to, but what, what does it mean? What, what does it provide you with? And I'll ask the same thing of, of Chief Richardson about functioning uh, um, today. Well, <laughs> um, I have become quite active in Ohio because of that being our homelands and the place where I, we were removed from and a federally recognized tribe is called a federally recognized tribe only because it can prove a treaty relationship with the United States. There are many, many groups that I have no doubt are Native American, but they can't prove a treaty relationship with the United States. And so mm -hmm. This was particularly, we have three federally recognized Shawnee tribes in the state of Oklahoma. And those are the only federally recognized Shawnee tribes in the United States. However, there were many groups in Ohio uh, who maintained that they were uh, tribes and the state of Ohio, uh, even though in the past they'd had about 45 different tribes that had lived there, resided there, they have no federally recognized tribes today. And so there's a vacuum there and they didn't always know who do we talk to? Who are the people who are really, what is a federally recognized tribe? So it, it's been a learning experience there and they have finally recognized that there are, even though they may not be, we may not be in Ohio today, we are federally recognized tribes and rather than talk about us, we always stress you need to talk with us and we will be glad to talk with you and, and to talk about the issues that we have and what we uh, need to do. So I'm going to stop there and let Ann pick up uh, because again, her experiences are different than mine. Well, I mean, to put it um, a little bit easier to understand, we're equivalent to a state basically. So when you think about the states and all the states being united, we are um, the equivalent of a state within a state, if you can imagine what that's like. So we have our own government um, that is uh, sovereign, just like a state. Um, they have their sovereignty. And we, have, we are required to have our own tribal government and run our own programs and provide for our people, just like a state would do. So it's very similar to that. Now, the federal recognition that, that um, the Rappahannock and, and a number of the other tribes in Virginia have, um, 
has been a catalyst for y'all, as I understand it, to collaborate on a sovereignty uh, accord that you are uh, seeking to employ that kind of goes in the other direction of trying to get Virginia to uh, grant the same recognition. Do I have that right? Can you talk about what that sovereignty discussion has been uh, about? Well, the sovereignty discussion has been an, an accord is not about um, recognition. The, okay. the accord is about um, how the construct of the government to government relationship that we have, that the tribes have as sovereigns of the United States, how hmm. that relationship will operate with the state of Virginia uh, as a sovereign of its own. So um, the accord is to establish those protocols, uh, to establish how that relationship will operate as we go forth and um, develop our own nations within the Commonwealth. And uh, that, that work is, is, is ongoing. And um, where, where does that stand? Uh, are you at a point where uh, you've, you've got a document that's under review? Is it going to take action in the General Assembly session coming up at the top we of the year? We have a document that is under review by the current governor. And um, I think several of the assembly members have gotten it. And uh, that will be an ongoing agenda for the General Assembly, yes. Um, both of you uh, uh, have had to deal with, as, as you know, the, the whole country, the world had to, uh, the impact of, of the coronavirus. And um, I, uh, in, in doing some research, as y'all know for this, was looking at some of the news stories and found two um, uh, very uh, significant examples of just what uh, the impacts were like. And, and I would ask y'all uh, to maybe comment on this. Chief Wallace, um, what uh, looked like happened with y'all at the start of the pan uh, pandemic was that there was a, a serious undercount of your folks and uh, took some corrective action to uh, uh, get that number right and then to see what sort of aid could come from that. Can you talk a bit about that? You are correct. Um, <clears throat> again, not just my tribe, but we have another uh, Shawnee tribe that is federally recognized that is just about 20 miles from us in Miami, Oklahoma. And uh, all of the conversation in the formula that was going to be used to determine how funds were going to be distributed was suddenly changed within a, a matter of hours before the funds were to be determined and distributed. And the formula went from one aspect of, aspect of it as being what is the enrollment in your tribe Rather than using the enrollment numbers, they used what's called an IHBG number. And IHBG stands for Indian Housing Block Development. So how many Indian houses have you built on your particular lands? And um, my sister Shawnee tribe, 20 miles from us, was affected even more uh, harshly and negatively than we were because they did not, they had been part of the Cherokee tribe and did not receive their federal recognition until the year 2000. And when they received their federal recognition, because by far the majority of the land in, in Oklahoma is taken up by 39 tribes, they were not given any land whatsoever. So if you don't have any land, you, you certainly aren't building any houses. So they had a population of over 3,000 people, but were counted as zero on the Indian Housing Block Grant, the IHBG formula. Um, it's, uh, all, these things aren't always easy to explain. And when you're in Washington, D.C. and trying to come up with formulas and situations, there isn't a simple cookie cutter method for tribes. And with our situation of being right here in the corner of four states, what houses we built, just like the Indian Health Service, recognized only that corner, that portion in Oklahoma. So we were underfunded according to the Harvard report by more than $7 million, which to a poor tribe is an astronomical number. Um, the Shawnee tribe, they filed a lawsuit and we did not file a lawsuit, but we did hire a lobbyist and we did hire a law firm to represent us. 
it, it took a long time. The Shawnee tribe at first lost their first case. They appealed it and it was ruled in their favor, appealed again, ruled in their favor. So they did receive compensation, not the amount that they would have. And the same is true, it affected other tribes that were enormously adversely affected by the formula that the US Treasury used. Mm. So rather than being underfunded by 7 million, we were given 3 million, so we were underfunded by four uh, because of, of that formula. Chief Richardson, the experience for the Rappahannock was a bit different, I believe. Um, can you talk about, uh, particularly once the money was coming in, what you were able to do with it? Well, our story was very similar um, because yeah. as newly federally recognized tribes, uh, we have no land in trust. And pretty much that's what they were looking for when um, the chief was talking about the IT, IGBG. Uh, funding, we, we've we never built houses. And so our funding was very limited and our service area is four counties of King and Queen, Caroline, Essex, and King William. Uh, and in those areas, we had never built houses. So our funding was greatly reduced because of that. Um, however, um, we were able to do some things with it uh, what we did get, and um, the main thing that we needed to do was to get broadband into our tribal center so that our tribal government could operate. Um, and so we did that. We were able to deploy um, and work with our counties to deploy broadband into our area, which would not have come in until maybe three or four years later. And so we were able to provide that for people in our community. Um, and so, and we continue to work on that. We also use some of the money to construct uh, a new corporate center for the tribal offices. And so um, our new administration building will house our emergency management and economic development and housing and all of those kinds of programs that are provided for our community. So it was, uh, it was a help, but it was not the help that we should have gotten. Um, I know another area that both of your tribes have been active have been uh, in uh, addressing um, the, the needs for recognition, um, uh, in some cases really almost rediscovery of some of the cultural resources associated with your tribes and with, with Indian peoples generally uh, within Virginia, within uh, that Oklahoma region. Um, Chief Richardson, uh, I know you've uh, been involved in lobbying for uh, support for conservation easements, working with the uh, Chesapeake Bay folks with the um, uh, uh, outdoor uh, found Virginia Outdoor Foundation. And can you talk a bit about some of the easements, um, some of the, the preservation work that y'all have been doing uh, through those coalitions? Well, um, so uh, we have always recognized the importance of our natural resources and we hold them dear to our hearts um, because we understand that uh, without keeping those things clean and pure that we will at some point in time demise with them. Uh, but um, so there are some ancestral lands that we have been looking at um, and those easements that we're looking at putting on are easements that will protect um, the eagle population that is there. Um, lots of um, lots of fowl and wildlife that just needs to be preserved. The place needs to be preserved for its beauty uh, and the enjoyment of being able to go there and kind of experience what the area would have been like prior to 1607. Um, it really has had no development and it's pretty pristine. And so we wanna keep it that way. Uh, so that's what we've been working on uh, with Chesapeake Conservancy and US Fish and Wildlife. Y'all are also involved along with a number of other tribes, uh, I believe in, in some of the discussion that took advantage of a, of, a, of a situation with a developer uh, and with Dominion resources uh, in the Commonwealth, our energy provider, 
to create um, uh, Macacoma, am, am I pronounce it right? Macacomico State Park? Mach Machacomico. Machacomico, I was close. Yeah. Um, but can you talk a bit about that? Because that's that a really striking um, uh, facility uh, that's been created there. It, it is a phenomenal facility. Um, the state has done such a wonderful job with it. But it was, again, slated for development houses, uh, McMansions going up on the river. And uh, some of the partners got together and began to fight for it and was able to wrangle it out of the hands of the developer and um, decided to make it a state park. And it's dedicated to the Virginia tribes. And so it's the experience there, if you haven't been there, is really magnificent. They are representing um, the history of the tribes on the walkway and the timeline, um, the various interactions with the tribes. And there is a, a modern interpretation of a longhouse there um, that kind of gives you the sense of what one might have looked like. Uh, or what it might have felt like being inside of one and uh, some really nice displays inside. So they've done a really good job with that. We're very proud of it. Um, I'm looking forward to getting there too, because I've not had the opportunity. And uh, just again, looking in some of the background, I uh, was really impressed with, uh, with what that's uh, doing. So hope to get there soon. Um, Chief Wallace, you were inspired by a, uh, a cultural site associated with your people in Ohio that um, has had the impact of development on it, but you see potential for uh, taking recognition of that to the world stage. Can you talk a bit about the mounds? The earthworks, I should say. Absolutely, um, and I'm glad to do so. I need to probably set a background for that of saying that when I taught at the small community college where I taught, uh, again, that's about 12, 13 miles from my home. And when I started at that small community college, there were only, it was a brand new community college and we had only about 500 students. And now that same community college has probably something like 5,000. So you can see that it has grown and it's in an extremely rural area. The state of Missouri has 114 counties and our little community college was restricted to two counties. And one of those counties was the second poorest in the state of Missouri. So um, I started out and became a, a department head of communications. And then the college decided they had too many departments and they wanted to join them into divisions. And so they joined communications with fine arts and design. Now my background contained nothing related to fine arts and design. The only reason I was named that division head is because I had a reputation for working hard, perseverance, uh, developing things. And uh, I knew that uh, we tried bringing cultural events into that small community college, but we didn't have an audience for them. And so I decided that instead I was going to have to take our students plus the community on trips to see cultural experiences. Mm -hmm. So I developed, uh, we took two international trips a year and one in the United States. So three trips a year. Consequently, because of that, I was able, even though I'm still living within 15 miles of where I was born, I was able to travel to 70 some countries and uh, not every single state, but most of the states in the United States. And I later learned that, and I was the one who was organizing where we would go, and I was always taking them to things that would be fine arts and design. So we were going to museums, we were going to theaters, we were going to uh, places where uh, very famous historical sites. Only later did I learn that those were really world heritage sites. Nice. So, I mean, I went and walked the Great Wall of China. I went to the Colosseum. I went to the Acropolis. I went to Australia to, and climbed Mount Uluru. Just name all of them. And I had been fortunate to go there. When I became chief in 2006, I, I, as I say, I had researched my tribe for three years and then had been talking about it for three years. And there's a, an author by the name of John Sugden, who is an English author, an excellent writer. And he had written a book on Tecumseh, 
which I had read and thoroughly appreciated it. But John Sugden was going to appear at a lecture at a lecture series at Ohio State University, and I wanted to see him. So I flew from Oklahoma to Ohio to listen to John Sugden and to meet him. Part of the requirement of the lecturers there is that the next day they were to go to a place called Newark Earthworks. Even though I had researched and studied Shawnees in Ohio for six years, I had never read, never heard a single thing about Newark Earthworks. And when I arrived, I find that Newark Earthworks are indeed mounds constructed, built, preserved, honored, observed religiously, culturally by Native Americans. And I arrived to find that there is a country club there and there is a golf course on top of those magnificent mounds. And mound after mound is being destroyed in Ohio and not being preserved. Because again, there are no federally recognized tribes in Ohio. The day that we were there, they were having a golf, uh, a golf tournament. And so they had all kinds of people there and the, the people who were driving the carts and, and transporting the golfers and people around, they let it be known that we were in the way, that we were not welcome, that we should not be there that day. And, and actually said, you don't belong here. You need to leave, come back some other time. And they actually permitted, uh, they closed the golf course one day a year so Native Americans could come to see those mounds. I was able to climb up on a wooden platform and look out at the Newark Earthwork Mounds. And because of all of the travel experiences that I had been fortunate enough to participate in, I realized that right there in front of me was something the equivalent of Stonehenge in, in England, you know, of, of the Great Wall of China, of the pyramids in Egypt. And even the people in Ohio didn't recognize what was there and, and very little effort to preserve or anything. Mm -hmm. And um, I witnessed, felt numerous emotions within two or three minutes. First, shock, surprise, elation that it was in existence. But then the longer I stood there, the more alienated and curious I became of why in the world are they playing golf on this? Why don't they recognize what this is? Why don't they observe it the way that it should be uh, observed? And I left there determined that if nobody else would speak up for, the, for those mounds in Ohio, I would. So in that time from 2007 to now, uh, Ohio has... Uh, particularly the Ohio History Connection. They have gotten behind this movement. Uh, we have a nomination in that is to be accepted next year for acceptance of four mounds there in Ohio to be uh, classified as World Heritage Sites. And so it's been a, a struggle. We're not there yet. The golf course is still on top of there. We've had to sue or we've been through uh, two courts They've ruled in our favor. We're still in the last stage of trying to uh, determine a price to pay them so that they will vacate the Ohio, the Newark Earthwork Mounds there, which is about 30 minutes from Columbus. So um, it's been frustrating, but it's also exciting uh, to think that it's going to happen. Well, and, and just uh, as you allude, and, and in the article I read alludes, that these are for, for this continent and for your peoples and for our peoples uh, who are, are all together. These are our pyramids. These are our great wall. They are, uh, they are. Uh, these are our Colosseum. These are intricate architectural constructions that were calibrated to lunar cycles that are, it's like so many things we know more of perhaps from the Maya or other cultures, but this is here on this continent, thousands of years, even before some of the tribes that we know from history, from peoples that we can't even necessarily document. And uh, I, I think that that in, in the case of what you've described, what Chief Richardson's describing, it's so important, not just to the history of your tribes or to Indi American Indian tribes, but to all of us to understand that these are the cultural resources that hopefully can unite us rather than be 
divisions. We can consider them part of our shared heritage. And uh, I think it's marvelous that, that y'all have been uh, involved in those efforts. Um, some seem more collegial and some more uh, adversarial, unfortunately, but I, I, I hope the, the, the result is, is uh, positive. Um, I could literally go on and do this for another three hours and if y'all wanted to, um, but I, I realized we're bumping up on to an hour or so and I, I wanted to see if Sarah and Chris wanted to come back on from the James Farmer Center from our Native American Club at the University of Mary Washington and see whether uh, there were any questions or comments that they had that they wanted to jo uh, join in with. So I'm I'm stalling until they can come on. There's Chris coming on, <laughs> and then we'll see if Sarah can join in with us. Um, uh, I do want to note Lindsay Crawford, our public programs coordinator, who had had an opportunity to uh, work with uh, uh, Chief uh, Wallace uh, at Fort Pitt Museum earlier in her museum career, uh, has been operating the board for us and helping with the, uh, the system navigation. There she is waving. So uh, Lindsay, if you've got a question for that matter. Um, before we get final thoughts from the Chiefs, I want to give you all a chance to uh, chime in if you like. Um, I've honestly just been sitting over here in kind of an awe of the work that you all are doing and have done and will continue to do for your tribes. Um, my question is, you know, let's say five, ten years from now, where do you envision uh, your tribes, let's say in the year 2030? Wow, that's uh, <laughs> down the road. <laughs> well, I can just tell you what um, the goal of our tribe has been since I um, became chief. And the goal is to restore um, the political and economic and cultural and social and spiritual life of our tribe and um, to bring back to them the things that we have lost. And, and what people don't really realize is it's not just a loss for us, it's a loss for everybody. Mm -hmm. And so as we work to say, restore river herring on the Rappahannock because it was a, a staple food source for our people, um, and to make sure that we always have blue crabs there for people to enjoy um, is not, not just bringing that back to us, but it's uh, our belief is uh, of the law of reciprocity is the more that you give, the more that you get back. And so um, we just continue to give and to preserve those things for everybody because the earth needs them and the people needs them. And so um, that's kind of where we, we are with that. But our archeological sites are being uncovered all the time and bringing back uh, more, a more complete history of our people. And, um, and that's, that's a win-win for everybody, not just us. So that's, that's really our goal and we are working toward that goal. Chief Wallace, where do, you, where do you see your tribe in that time frame? First, let me just say amen, amen to everything that uh, Chief Richardson said, because um, many of those things are true for us as well. Where we are quite different in is that uh, where we are in Ottawa County, for at least the last 20 or 30 years, we have been identified as the number one super fund, super polluted site in the United mm. States. Um, <clears throat> this area was where there was extensive uh, lead and zinc mining at a time mm -hmm. when there were not regulations, when there were not federal requirements for watching what uh, happened. And, uh, and when they finally did leave the area, they left. Uh, we are supposedly a rather mm -hmm. flat land area. And instead, you look out and you would think that we have mountains and instead they are chat piles and remaining dregs from the mining industry that was here. Our water is extremely polluted. We have very high lead levels in our children. We have health issues. And so 
In our case, we would not want to be, be preserving that. We would want to be changing that and restoring that uh, to what it was prior in prior years. So we want to be part of, we have environmental concerns. They aren't unfortunately the same environmental concerns that they have. We, we hope we can reach that at some point. Uh, like uh, she indicated, we would love to be more uh, culturally uh, involved and know our history. Uh, I would say that we would also uh, hope to establish something in Ohio so that they would have a federally recognized tribe and that they would uh, have resources there that they could, that we are thankful for the relationship that we have established there and that other tribes have as well. Um, we have been successful. I, I haven't said anything about it, but I have to say gaming is what has changed our tribe. Uh, mm -hmm. We started a bingo hall in 1984 and that bingo hall was very successful. And since then we have established uh, two other casinos and just last week for the first time, um, my mother used to be secretary treasurer of this tribe. So we're talking about a one generation time period. When my mother was secretary treasurer, we, we received $50 a year from the government. That was our income. We didn't own a single building. We didn't have a single filing cabinet. We, we, we had nothing. And we have been able to pay that off and as I say, we've gone from 400 acres to 2,500 acres, and we are debt free today and proud of it because we have managed our money very, very carefully. And while we make lots of mistakes, we've been fortunate enough to have far more successes than mistakes. And so we learn from those mistakes. So my goal is I don't want my people to have to depend upon the government. We want to be independent and be able to uh, encourage our people to work, support themselves, uh, achieve and be successful and be proud of our heritage and proud of the future. And it's all up to them to do that. Amen. Yes. Um, I had another question and it has slipped my mind for the moment, um, but it was an important question. <laughs> <laughs> Sarah, did you, Sarah, while he's thinking, did you have anything? Uh, sure. Um, I, I guess a question that I kind of just kind of thought of, um, what are your guys' thoughts on the, um, the federal uh, Indian school uh, initiative that uh, Secretary Deb Holland um, started to put together this past summer. Um. I think it's wonderful um, that she's taken that on and I'm so proud of the work that she's been able to do since she's been in office um, to bring to light all of the things that have um, been covered over at these Indian boarding schools. Um, we had young children that were taken by the Quakers to Carlisle and we never knew what happened to them. There were no records of them. Um, and so I'm really excited that she's able to do this for tribes. And um, also, I just wanted to let you know, anytime you guys would like to come down to the tribal center, we would love to host you. I'll echo her <laughs> comments. Uh, I, I'm, um, Deb Holland is just doing some wonderful work. I'm, I'm pleased that uh, she's been uh, put in the position that she is and um, of where we live we had an Indian school within seven miles of here and so we know about that. There were atrocities but at the same time I have to say the living conditions for many of the children were so bad at home that for many of them it was a better experience of being there so there's both good and bad. I think we all hope for a future of simply good, simply good. Uh, one of the things that I'm proud of in my tribe is that uh, we have uh, financed a, a very significant scholarship program for our students. And so any member of our tribe, regardless of where they live, they are eligible for $6,000 per semester of financial help for them to continue uh, either academic or vocational training. And so 
Uh, we believe that that's, that's the way that it's a hand up, not a hand out, and that they have to work to maintain those trades and that they will be better at, uh, for that. So uh, education is important to me. Indeed. Um, I, one thing I didn't really think about uh, to even ask before, uh, uh, before we started recording or even prior, had either had y'all met each other before? Have you had prior contact before? None, none whatsoever. No. Well, I think that that uh, the James Rowe Museum and James Farmer, Farmer Multicultural Center can take a little pride mm -hmm. in having brought the two of you together in this program. Not only have we benefited, but I hope you all have benefited from seeing what uh, uh, your counterpart um, in different parts of the country, different tribal cultures have done. It, it is really remarkable. I think we're extraordinarily fortunate, uh, one might say blessed, to have had the opportunity to, to hear from y'all this evening, to be able to speak with you. Um, uh, look forward to the chance, I hope, of doing it again. Um, um, and Chris, I, I don't know if you came up with that question or not. Did you, did you remember it? Yeah. Sorry, my unmute function was giving me <laughs> technical difficulties. <laughs> Um, I, well, I just want to thank you for the opportunity to be here, and it's been a pleasure to meet and to listen to, to Chief Richardson and her experiences. So um, I, I think it well illustrates what I would say about tribes, that there are, you know, 570 some federally recognized tribes. No two are identical. We are all separate, unique, uh, have our own backgrounds, have our own situations. Uh, but we, we work together, and uh, again, I think it's a desire of all of us that we do not want to be a burden upon the United States, even though our beginnings may not have been the best. This is a fabulous country and a country that we love, and uh, we want to be supportive and contribute to it, not have to take from it. Nice to have met you. Yeah. Chris, Chris, what was your question before we uh, wrap up here? I want to know how the average everyday person can be supportive um, to the tribes. Well, uh, you know, lots of people ask me that question. And um, I think that being supportive to the tribes is really just respecting uh, Native culture and making a place for us where there was no place before. Um, you know, Governor Northam has done a, a great job in bringing ab about racial equity in the state and um, just the acknowledgement that tribes exist and that they had something to contribute uh, and making room for that, that space for them. So I think that's, that's one of the main things. Advocate for um, the things that uh, they advocate for, um, both you know, we just had an election. We have a new governor coming on. And um, politically, uh, we have small numbers, but we're mighty in our advocacy. And so, um, you know, just to stand alongside the tribes um, will help them a lot. My response to that is, again, I think we are a, a mirror in many ways to the overall United States. Uh, I don't think we have enough people who are active enough in our elections. I don't think we have enough people uh, who are active enough in attending meetings or participating in developing our language programs or something. So involvement, and that's a challenge to us, is to how do we instill that, that interest in them and, and how do we get that information to them? I would say the one way that we are different is again, that we are in the state of Oklahoma and the state of Oklahoma right now is, no one is quite sure of what to do because as I indicated, we were removed in 1832. We were given a reservation at that time, but there had been the, the aspect of thinking that those reservations were disestablished. And just within this last year, the McGirt ruling came down in Oklahoma that said those reservations had never been disestablished. So we are all still reservations uh, today or every court case that has gone forward. So the state of Oklahoma and the tribes are uh, in another learning situation and a new situation of uh, 
who's in charge of the legal aspects, which is extremely important. So we're going to have to have conversations. We have our challenges before us, but it's always good to be challenged because that brings out the best in us. And I, I, I echo off of that. That's par partially the reason I wanted to do this program today is to give um, a platform for you all to share your stories um, and to give that space for you all um, and the impact you are making. Um, so I just wanted to say personally, thank you so much for coming today and giving us, I know you both have such slam schedules. I appreciate you all giving us the time of day today for this, this uh, program. Thank you, Lindsay. Thanks, Lindsay. Thank you. Chris, you got one more thing? Uh, Chief Richardson, I'm going to take you up on that offer. <laughs> oh, please do. <laughs> please do. Yes, it doesn't stop here. This is this, this program is ending, but I think it's opening up a lot of more a lot more doors for us to explore. So, Chief Ann Richardson uh, of the Rappahannock uh, Tribe, Chief Glenna Wallace of the uh, Eastern Shawnee of Oklahoma Tribe, thank you so much for a fantastic program. Chris, uh, James Farmer Multicultural Center, I think we did it again. And uh, we can go back to our bosses and tell them what a good job we're doing. So thank you all very much and uh, do have a pleasant evening. Thank you, you Scott. Too. Thank you.